Twins for the Mountain Fighter by Melinda Curtis. Chapter 1. Evicted. Thea Gale thought she might be sick. Her nanny paychecks hadn't appeared, and her landlord hadn't been sympathetic this time. Not even when she pointed out her two young charges would also be homeless if he kicked them out. Can we go home now? Ten-year-old Hannah plucked a dandelion from the sparse grass at her feet. A gentle breeze lifted wisps of blonde hair that escaped from her braid. Hannah perched on the corner of a black suitcase so large she could have fit in it, had it not been stuffed with everything the girl owned. They hadn't moved beyond the cracked Seattle sidewalk, edged with crabgrass, upon which the apartment complex land the Lord had left them fifteen minutes ago. Our real home? We don't have a home, Tess proclaimed in a wobbly voice. She stuck her little chin out, daring Thea or Hannah, her twin, to contradict her. It'll be all right. Swallowing back the demoralizing taste of despair, Thea stepped over her laptop bag and drew Tess to her. The bells laced onto her red keds jingled. According to Thea's grandmother, joyful noise kept spirits up. She needed more than joyful noise today. She needed a miracle. She'd settle for her employer showing up, check in hand. Young Tess kept her body stiff in Thea's arms, staunchly refusing to show any sign that she was comforted in any way. She was the brightest, most standoffish child Thea had ever come across. And despite Thea's best efforts these past two months, she'd been unable to break through the barriers Tess and Hannah had erected around their hearts after their mother died. Home is where the heart is. You know, where you hang your hat and park your flip-flops. Thea tried to keep the words light, knowing she failed. Their mom was dead, and their truck-driving dad had dropped off the radar. And since Thea could relate to mother's leaving and dad's and not caring enough, how upbeat could she be? Still, she had to try. There's a better home for you out there. One with a, a backyard, and trees. Since she was a kid, Thea had tried to go through life looking for silver linings and encouraging those around her to do the same. She wouldn't let a few minor setbacks, like being evicted or not knowing where her employer was, get her down. At least, she hoped she wouldn't. Thea forced her gaze away from the mocking piles of chaos that surrounded the twins. Three bulging suitcases, a laptop computer, several boxes of textbooks and notebooks, two pink scuffed backpacks and one box with the meager remnants of their pantry were scattered in disarray around the porch of what had formerly been their sparsely furnished apartment. A house. Hannah made a wish, blew the white dandelion fronds into the air and shut her eyes tight, adding in a whisper, a house with a staircase leading up to a magic room. With lots of friends nearby, Tess added, to Thea's surprise. That's the spirit. Thea managed a weak smile. You won't leave us, will you? Hannah turned her big blue eyes to Thea, her bottom lip quivering. No, Thea hastened to reassure the girl. She might only be their nanny, but she cared about them. If only they'd let themselves care in return. This is all his fault, huffed Tess, turning her back to Thea and crossing her skinny arms over her thin chest. Assuming Tess referred to her father, Thea didn't argue. The girl was right. If Wes Delaney had paid Thea or his cell phone bill, his was disconnected, they'd be on the other side of that apartment door right now. If Thea could turn back the clock, she'd never again complain about the peeling paint on the door or the walls so thin you could hear the couple next door arguing. She'd be sitting contentedly at the kitchen table, studying for her PhD exams while the twins did their homework on either side of her. Two months ago, Wes's advertisement for a nanny-slash-housekeeper had seemed a blessing. Working on her PhD in textiles had taken Thea longer than she'd planned. She'd finished her coursework and was studying for her written and oral exams. Her savings had dipped dangerously low, so she'd taken the position with the Delaney's, which would have been fine if she'd been better at prioritizing the needs of the twins against progress on her studies. Now her exams were rapidly approaching, and she was woefully unprepared and lacking a place to sleep. Uncertainty, clutched Thea's heart. No place to live. Less money than ever. Running out of hope that she'd fulfill the promise she'd made to make something of herself. And with Wes gone to heaven knew where, he couldn't be dead, could he? What was she going to do with the twins? As if aware of her rising panic, Tess walked down the front path to the curb where Thea's yellow Volkswagen Beetle was parked. After a moment, Hannah followed her sister, 
stopping a careful distance from her twin. Neither spoke. Neither touched. But Thea had the distinct impression that they knew what the other was thinking. She knew it, too. They wanted to turn their backs on this chapter of their life and move on. Ditto. Life wasn't supposed to be so hard on kids. She ached for them. And a little for her own childhood. What had the twins been like before their mother died? Thea closed her eyes as she tried to envision Tess's small face with a joyous grin or scrunched up in tickle-induced laughter. She tried to imagine a more outgoing, confident Hannah. Or the two sisters holding hands as they walked home from school, giggling and sharing confidences as siblings were supposed to do. Much as she tried, Thea couldn't quite picture them that way. Having buried their mother six months ago and being raised, if you could call it that, by a malingering father, who didn't seem very interested in his daughters the four or five days he was home every month, it was no wonder the girls were so withdrawn. Turning them into the police or some impersonal social agency was out of the question. They'd just be passed from one foster home to another. Tess would continue to refuse to eat more than kept her alive and Hannah would continue to eat to salve her pain. They may have been identical twins, but their grief had taken its toll on their bodies in different ways. Unfortunately, Thea knew she couldn't take care of them forever. With less than $100 to her name, she'd have trouble figuring out a way to keep them fed for more than a few days. I want to go home. Hannah turned back to Thea, fingering the hem of her yellow sundress. To Idaho. He won't take us. Tess shook her head without facing them. She shoved her hands into the back pockets of her jean shorts. Is that where your father is? In Idaho? Thea's spirits rose. Maybe this was just a huge misunderstanding. Wes could wire them some money and the landlord would let them back into the apartment. Hannah stepped around a box of Thea's books, something uncharacteristically bright shining in her eyes. Uncle Logan lives in Idaho. In Silver Bend. We lived with him when Mom got sick. Thea's spirits deflated as quickly as they'd risen. The twins rarely mentioned their uncle. He hadn't called since she'd been with them. He hadn't written to ask about the girls, hadn't sent them birthday cards. If she had to guess, Thea would say Uncle Logan didn't care what happened to his nieces. Please. Hannah touched Thea's hand with one finger before stepping back. The gesture said so much more than the reticent little girl ever would. The twins tolerated Thea's hugs, but didn't seek out physical contact. Why on earth would this uncle in Idaho help them now? An ant crawled up the side of the box containing the bread, peanut butter, and cereal. If Thea didn't decide to do something soon, the ants would claim the last of their food. Perhaps the twins' uncle was the only person they could turn to. Lifting her gaze to the blue sky, Thea refused to think about the folders filled with notes at her feet, or her looming exams, or the balance on her credit card that was already too high to pay off. And she would not think about the penalties for taking the girls without their father's permission. She'd filed a missing persons report on West three weeks ago. If West Delaney was alive, he'd abandoned his daughters. She'd do anything to keep them out of the foster care system. With a stomp of her foot and a jingle of bells, it was decided. Let's load the car. She was taking the twins to Idaho. They're declaring this fire a runaway to the east. Golden slid on a patch of ice as he came down a slope on Hindman Peak, east of Sun Valley, Idaho. Logan McCall tensed, reliving his own tumble last summer, one that had snapped his femur. The bone had healed, but still ached. He lifted his arm to wipe the sweat off his forehead with the long sleeve of his shirt. It might be less than 40 degrees on this sunny spring day in the mountains, but the fire above him had warmed everything here to snow-melting, sweat-dripping degrees. Logan's body felt the fire's heat from head to toe, but the flames could never warm his heart. We want to stay with you. Logan wiped his forearm across his eyes, trying to erase the image of his niece Hannah's pleas a few months ago. Regret twined with guilt in his chest, spinning ever tighter until he could barely suck in a breath. He shoveled dirt and melting snow at the fire. Did the fire jump the line, Golden? His boss and best friend nodded, clipping his radio onto the front strap of his pack. Winds pushed it across the road to the east. It's heading down the mountain to the ski resort. Danger. Logan. 
welcomed it and the accompanying adrenaline rush. Anything to keep from remembering, from feeling. The other hot shots stopped working to listen. The Silver Bend Hot Shot crew was working with two other fire crews on a prescribed burn above a Sun Valley ski resort. The Department of Forestry had decided they needed to set a controlled burn in a timber area that had been weakened by two years of drought and ravaged by bark beetles. Without water, the pines had been unable to produce enough sap to protect against the hungry insect, which bored into the bark and ate the dry trees from the inside out. The large percentage of dead pines on this side of the mountain was a huge risk for wildfires later in the year. Some bureaucrats seemed to think that the snow and rock farther up the ridge would stop the fire from crossing over to the other side of the mountain. But they hadn't figured on winds changing direction and pushing the fire down the mountain, had they? Gazing up the slope, Logan saw nothing but orange pines swaying in the wind, orange from the flames consuming dry branches or orange needles indicating the tree had succumbed to the beetle long before the fire succumbed. Given up. Lost. That's what his sister Deb had done. She'd stopped treatment to fight the brain tumor. She'd given up. And now, his twin, his better half, was gone. A runaway fire? Are we being reassigned to the east? Spider was a wiry firefighter about Logan's age. Seeing him in hot shot garb, a yellow button-down shirt and forest green khakis, was always something of a shock. Off-duty, Spider preferred the black color usually associated with the creepy crawly that was his namesake. All the hot shots had nicknames. Jackson was golden because he was lucky, Doc so named because he went to medical school in the off-season, and the queen because she was a redhead named Victoria. Logan was the Tin Man, a name he'd earned by being the most confirmed bachelor among his crew. They gave each other monikers to lighten the mood when battling the deadly flames. Not to say that they weren't businesslike on the fire line. Lots of ski bunnies down that slope at the ski lodge, Tin Man. Chainsaw nudged Logan with his elbow, his namesake resting on his broad shoulders. He, the queen and a bulldozer had cleared a twenty-foot-wide path through the trees that cut across their side of Hinman Park. We'll look like heroes. Dateless and desperate. The queen rolled her eyes. Well, they might not always be businesslike, but they got the job done. Send my group out first, Golden, before Tin Man starts breaking hearts and making all of mankind look bad. Spider's words baited. Refusing the challenge, Logan looked away, heat burning in his gut near as hot as the fire above them. Since losing Deb six months ago, he'd lost his sense of humor. In its place was guilt and regret, and an anger that could flare quicker than a forest fire. Don't push him, Spider. Golden was the superintendent of the Silver Bend team, and the keeper of the peace. Logan and Spider were his two assistant superintendents, each in command of a team of nine men and women. Spider cast a shovel full of dirt and snow toward Logan's feet. A growl coiled in Logan's throat. Enough. Both of you. Our team is watching the line here. Golden banished any hope of recreational action at the ski lodge, eliciting a series of muffled grumbles among the team. They're sending the snakes. The Snake River hot shot crew from Pocatello, Idaho. Many on the crew groaned. Three quarters of the hot shots were single and under age 35. If Deb had still been alive, Logan might have groaned along with them. Back to work, Logan called out to his team. The wind whistled past him from a new direction, Mother Nature letting them know she wasn't going down without a fight. Spread out and make sure this beast doesn't jump our line. Let's go help the snakes, Golden. Spider turned to Logan with that infuriating grin of his. Tin Man needs some action. He's so tense. Shut up, Spider, Logan said through gritted teeth. Like a volcano about to blow. Spider tossed another shovelful of dirt and snow toward Logan. This is public service work, I'm telling ya. Before Logan realized what he was doing, he had Spider by the straps of his backpack and was nose to nose. I said, shut up. Hands yanked Logan back. Golden dragged him farther down the road, away from the others. But the anger came with Logan. And he was glad. His anger was too big to allow the painful memories back in. What's wrong with you? Golden looked him square in the eye. It's just Spider. Shake it off, dude. 
it wasn't just Spider. It was Deb and her girls. So much loss. So much helpless anger. It crowded his chest and demanded release. Shake it off, Golden repeated, scowling at Logan. I don't know how. No matter how pitiful that sounded, it was the truth. Logan McCall is a ghost. Thea tucked her phone in her purse at a convenience store on the outskirts of Boise, Idaho. He had no home phone. He wasn't on social media. He didn't come up as being arrested, graduated, or dead. Thea had been searching the internet for him at every stop. Now they were less than two hours away from Silver Bend and the twins' uncle was nowhere to be found. Just like their father. Which meant they might have come all this way for nothing. Thea. Thea, come quick. It was Hannah, standing over by the gas station's rusty garbage bin. She looked okay. Her white t-shirt was a little dirty, but... Tess. Where was Tess? Thea's heart stopped until she caught a glimpse of Tess' head bobbing up in the Volkswagen. Thea ran over to Hannah, bells jingling on her keds. What is it? What's wrong? Hannah pointed at something between the garbage bin and the brick wall. There's something back there. I think it's a puppy. I think it's stuck. Let me look. Thea put her head near the wall and tried to see into the narrow gap. It's a pile of rags. No, Hannah insisted. Something squeaked beneath the rags, interrupting whatever protests Thea had been about to voice. Hear that? It's a puppy. Hannah's features settled into a rare frown. It's stuck. It could be a rat. A disease-carrying, unhappy rodent. We'll tell the sales clerk. A distressed whimpering ensued. There was no mistaking it now. Rats didn't whimper. All right. We'll get it out. But how? There was no way Thea or Hannah could wiggle their way into the narrow opening between the trash bin and the wall. Thea gripped the cool, rusted metal and tugged. Nothing budged. Hannah set her feet against the wall and pushed. The bin groaned forward, maybe an inch. The pleas for help became louder. What are you doing? Tess had come over from the car and stood with her arms crossed in familiar, obvious disapproval. We're saving a puppy. Hannah grunted with the effort of pushing and talking at the same time. We'll be done much faster if you help. Thea stepped back and looked at the imprint of the metal bin on her hands. It figured that the trash bin was full and as heavy as an elephant. Tess rolled her eyes and seemed about to refuse when the dog whimpered again. Then she, too, was pushing on the bin. In the end, the convenience store cashier, a reed-thin teenage boy, came out to help them push, pull and tug the bin away from the wall enough so that Hannah could slip back and pick up the bundle of rags. Be careful. It might not realize you're rescuing it, Thea cautioned. All she needed was for the dog to bite one of the twins to cap their string of bad luck. Hannah backed out of the gap and handed the bundle to Thea. Poor thing. Someone's wrapped it like a mummy. Thea knelt and carefully peeled away the rags, each layer unwrapping anger and sadness inside her. Who could be so cruel? The more she unwrapped, the stronger the unpleasant smell of urine. The dog was crooning to them now, a constant, weak complaint. He didn't snarl or move to escape when the final layer was lifted. He just blinked up at them in the bright March sunlight. Poor baby. Hannah reached down to pet him. Don't, Thea warned. We don't know if he's going to bite. Or if he had rabies. Plus, he was covered in a layer of pungent yellow pee, not all of it dry. What are we going to do? Hannah inched closer. Thea gazed down at the defeated little dog in her lap. She shouldn't take on another responsibility. We'll have the cashier call animal control or whoever takes abandoned animals around here. They'll clean him up and find him a home. No. It's an orphan. Like us. Hannah's face crumpled as she began to cry. And that's how Thea found herself driving to Silver Bend with no place to call home, a car full of her possessions, two abandoned girls and a clean, small white terrier with brown spots. Stop. Hannah cried as they drove through town. 
she pointed to a restaurant ahead. If Uncle Logan's not at home, he's at the Painted Pony. The little dog in Hannah's lap perked his ears. He had the sweetest disposition and was cute, once they'd washed him in the convenience. Store's bathroom sink. Thea parked in the lot next to the Painted Pony restaurant. A life-size plastic horse waited for them on the wooden porch. But Hannah didn't head to the front door. The little girl ran around to the back, dragging the terrier behind her with the braided collar and leash Thea had made with scraps of material. Wizer kept his nose to the ground and frequently lifted his leg to try to mark his territory, living up to the name Tess had given him. Where are you going, Hannah? Thea swung her straw purse onto her shoulder. Rufus has a dog run in the back. Tess came to stand next to Thea. Rufus owns this place. Thea tore her gaze away from Hannah, who was disappearing through a back gate, to look at Tess. Who's Rufus? Our friend Heidi's grandma owns the pony. Tess sighed as if this trip was one big lost cause. She may be right. And Rufus is Heidi's dog. Got it. Hannah returned, panting for breath as she jogged toward the door. Hurry, let's see if they're inside. No one's here, Han. None of their trucks are here. But Tess followed her sister inside, nonetheless. Whose trucks? Perhaps she should have spent less time worrying in silence on the drive and more time asking questions. Tess flashed Thea a scornful look. The hot shots. They eat at the Painted Pony before they leave and when they get back from fighting forest fires. Now they were getting somewhere. So, someone inside should know where your uncle is? Have his phone number? Or better yet, his address? Yeah. Tess steps slowed. Don't slow down now. Thea swept an arm around her, hurting her inside. The Painted Pony was without pretense, black and white tile floor, for mica tables, worn green booth seats. There was a sturdy-looking bar, a jukebox on the far wall near a pool table and a small, scuffed dance floor. This was a place to come for good food and good conversation. A middle-aged woman with short gray hair, a weathered face and kind eyes hugged Hannah. Tess hesitated when the woman called her over, but finally submitted and received her embrace with much the same suffering expression as she did when Thea hugged her. I'm Mary Sokrath. I own the pony. The woman extended her hand as she came toward Thea, her expression curious. We haven't seen these two angels in quite some time. Before Thea could shake her hand, Hannah asked in her soft, polite voice, Where's Uncle Logan? I thought I saw you two dart in, observed a tall, slender old woman coming in the door behind Thea. Her gait was as stilted as a pigeon's. Bertie, come in and meet, Mary looked expectantly at Thea. I'm Thea. Have you seen? Where's Uncle Logan? Hannah interrupted. The thin woman stepped closer. What brings you to Silver Bend, Thea? Are you one of Logan's girls? Introduce yourself, Bertie, Mary gently chastised, then did it for her. Bertie runs the general store across the street. Are those Christmas bells on your sneakers? Bertie was more interested in interrogations than introductions. Are you from the North Pole? One of Logan's string of girls. He doesn't date locals, you know. Tess snorted. Thea's head started to ache. She wasn't sure which question to answer first. Thea's our nanny. We're looking for Uncle Logan. Hannah's voice trembled. Oh, not Wes's wife, eh? An old man pushed his way past Bertie, flashing Thea a grin beneath his bulbous nose. He gave a small wave. Smiley Peterson, town barber. Thea draped her arm protectively across Hannah's shoulders, wishing everyone would just slow down. With a huffing noise, Tess slumped into an empty booth. We're looking for Logan McCall. Thea didn't have time for gossip and speculation. He still lives in town, doesn't he? Yes, he does. Bertie smiled, and Thea thought they were getting somewhere until she added, Are you here long, dear? I want my Uncle Logan, Hannah wailed, unable to contain herself any longer. She began to cry. Everyone in the room seemed to freeze. The third-degree questioning stopped. Thea led Hannah to the booth Tess had claimed and had her sit down. Please, give her a little room, Thea pleaded, 
pressing a napkin into Hannah's hand so she could wipe her tears. I'll get her a glass of water. Mary was on the move. Not to be outdone, Bertie plucked several cookies from under a covered dish on the bar. You aren't saving these chocolate chippers for anyone, are you, Mary? Smiley patted Hannah on top of her head. The boys are up in Sun Valley fighting a fire. Heard on the radio that it jumped out of bounds, but the hot shots contained it. Logan's not here. Thea's heart sank. Hannah blew her nose, then accepted a cookie. Tess pushed the cookie birdie offered to the middle of the table, where Thea was sure it would remain untouched. When is Logan coming home? Thea prodded. I'd say another day or so, Bertie chirped. Maybe more. Oh, my. Thea felt her heart drop to the tips of her toes. Maybe more? That could be a week. A week? You can get a room over at the motel, Smiley suggested. No. They couldn't. Thea didn't have to take out her wallet to know they couldn't spend one more night in a hotel. One night had been enough to drain her funds significantly. Dad's gone and we don't have any money, Tess announced, causing Thea's cheeks to heat with embarrassment and creating another ripple of response from Mary, Bertie, and Smiley. I'll make lunch for everyone. On the house. Mary disappeared. Where's that father of yours? Bertie's expression hardened with. Disapproval. Ought to be shot, that man, Smiley grumbled. Thea wriggled her foot, eliciting a jingle, and tried to smile. We haven't heard from Wes in quite some time. Later, after Hannah polished off a cheeseburger with fries and Tess picked at a similar plate, Mary pulled Thea aside. I've called Lexi, my daughter-in-law. She's got a key to Logan's place. She'll be here after school lets out to take you over. Glenn is at the house, so you won't be alone. Don't worry about a thing. Logan will make things right. Thea hoped so. But she wasn't convinced Logan was any better for the girls than her father. I asked this where you used to live. Thea followed Mrs. Garrett's SUV up Uncle Logan's steep gravel driveway. It's lovely. We don't live anywhere, Tess snapped, ignoring the tall pines, the big boulders, the round patches of snow. Slumped in the back seat, she had a knot the size of a football in her tummy. Her best friend was in Mrs. Garrett's SUV. Or at least, Heidi used to be her best friend. Her eyes filled with tears. She blinked them away. They continued up Uncle Logan's driveway. Wizard put his front paws on the passenger window and scratched. Hannah put the window down an inch and held him up so he could get air. The little dog breathed in deeply several times, pressing his wet nose to the window and wagging his tail as if he dreamed of peeing on all those trees. The darn dog peed on everything. He'd even tried to go on her right after they washed him in the sink in the gas station bathroom. Wow. Thea shut off the engine. It's got trees, and a mountain for a backyard, and friends. It's, it's perfect. Tess shook her head. The two-story log home wasn't perfect. This is where my mom died. She bit her lip. It was bad enough it was true. She didn't need to say it out loud. She didn't need to remember holding mom's cold hand. Touching her thin blonde hair. Listening to her breathe like a hooked fish on the shore. And she wanted to forget the pain in her chest when mom didn't breathe at all. Mrs. Garrett and Heidi climbed out of their SUV. Thea, Hannah and Wizard got out of the Volkswagen. Tess didn't move. She clutched a quilt on the seat next to her and considered burrowing underneath it. I'll introduce you to Glenn, Mrs. Garrett said to Thea. She's got a touch of dementia. Tess had almost forgotten Great Aunt Glenn was staying with Uncle Logan. She was old. Really old. I check in on Glenn twice a day when the guys are working a fire, but it's been hard with the baby. Mrs. Garrett hurried up the porch steps and unlocked the door. I'll feel better now that you'll be here with her all the time. I'm sorry we can't stay. Henry's got a doctor's appointment down the mountain in an hour, but you'll be fine. Mary said the casserole brigade would bring you food. The casserole brigade had brought them food after mom died. Yuck. Hey. Heidi stepped into the Volkswagen's open car door, the one Hannah hadn't closed. 
Tess managed a strangled, hey, back, which was followed by a painful silence. Mrs. Garrett raced back to her SUV. Heidi, come on. You can catch up with the twins later. See you, Heidi called as she left with her mom, her healthy, living mom, and returned to her happy, normal life. Tess slumped over onto the quilt and tried to stop the tears.